So me and Seamus did oh, a right. sit down. Uh, Patrick actually moderated, and we just talked about making animation. He does Freedom Tunes. I do the Babylon B animation. And he did Axe Cop. An Axe Cop, which is stuff. fantastic. If you guys Thank haven't you. seen Axe Cop, it's hysterical. And so we just talk about doing that stuff, and mm -hmm. uh, we go deep. It's a really great talk. I think it's like an hour, probably. We it's, talked it's for a pretty while. long. So uh, we're releasing it to our subscribers now. Eventually, at some point, we might release it on YouTube. Who knows? But, if you're uh, lucky. Yeah. Hey, how's everybody doing hey, today? What's up, everybody? We got uh, it's me and Seamus Coglin. A Freedom it Tunes. Is, wait, I, I it's, it right? You know, you actually got it right. right. Yes. Yeah. And this oh, is wow. it's me and Ethan Klein of H three. H3. No, <laughs> Ethan, me and Ethan. I never knew about that. I told this whole thing with Crowder. What happened? Oh, I knew about H3. I actually, yeah, I, I heard he has a big deal, I guess. Yeah, yeah I thought I his skits. Sorry, Patrick's here too. He's going to interview us. Yeah, <laughs> Patrick's going to interview us. <laughs> He's going to make sure we talk. I mm -hmm. thought, um, I thought H3 stuff was really funny when he was doing the skits. I never watched much of the podcast. I didn't have strong feelings on it one way yeah. or another, but then the Crowder drama was disappointing. Mm -hmm. yeah, I shouldn't I even say like disappointing because yeah. I, I, I didn't have strong feelings about him one way or the other, but I did used to think he was really funny when I'd watch his stuff. Yeah. And maybe like he's I, still, yeah. I, I don't know, like maybe he's still a fun guy. Yeah, because I saw like he would defend Chappelle when everyone was kind mm -hmm. of going on him. Mm -hmm. That was the one thing, but then yeah, the Crowder thing was pretty weird. It was like... And it's kind yeah. of a weird thing where they might not necessarily have become enemies if they had encountered each other in a different context. Yeah. But maybe they would have, I don't know. Yeah. So the point of this conversation yeah, is not, animation. Not, we're, we're, we're kind of veering off in all sorts of directions. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I made one bad joke and uh, <laughs> we get into Crowder drama. But yes, yeah. we are here to talk animation. Well, Seamus, like, what was what was like the start for animation? Like, what was the big influences for you that made you even like start the draw? Because to me, like, drawing is so foreign. So like, were you always drawing when you were younger? Yeah, when I was a little kid, I liked to draw a lot. So ever since I was, I don't know, three, and this is, it's an interesting question. When did you start drawing? Uh, there was a YouTube video I saw a while ago. And what they basically said was when someone asks that question, what they really want to know is when you got serious about drawing, because <laughs> everyone sort of started drawing yeah, when like they were really little. Figures. Yeah, and I loved drawing a lot as a kid. I don't know that there was ever one moment where I was like, I'm going to dedicate myself to this, but I just always loved cartooning specifically. Mm. And I taught, I began teaching myself to animate when I was about 12 years old. Like with what exactly? With like the flip books or like? So I purchased a copy of Macromedia Flash 3 off of eBay for like $30. And this would have been, I was 12 years old. So this was, I believe, 2007. Mm. And so it was already like a 10 year old software at that point. It was yeah. really old and we were running mm -hmm. it under the family's old e-machines computer. Mm -hmm. and I was drawing with the mouse and <laughs> over time I improved slowly but surely. And then when I was 14, I did my first freelance gig. So that was exciting. I was just who? Uh, There was a comedian who wanted me to animate one of his bits. And so I did, and it was like dirt cheap. I, he paid me like 15 bucks. Was he a known comedian <laughs> or just like kind no, of No, I mean, he, he's a funny dude. He does some independent stuff, but I don't want to associate oh, okay. the poor fellow with me. No, no, sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind of you. Um, yeah. And so I was just doing these little freelance gigs on and off for different random clients. And then when I turned 18 and graduated high school, I remember saying, I'm just going to start my own business. I don't want to. Were on. you ever like thinking of going to college for it or? Well, I had, I had. So basically my high school had a television station. It was, it mm. was very well funded. We grew up in a, a nice suburb and the school had this TV station. It was like the cable access station for the whole community. And it was run by students at the high school. And so my teacher, Bill Allen, who uh, I will do the disservice of associating with myself. <laughs> would always just encourage me and he would really encourage me to get things done. So that was a big thing. I would have so many ideas. And at some point he just started like ragging on me. He was like, oh, are you gonna tell me like another idea you're not gonna finish? Like it, it was tough love, Whoa. but he would really get down on me about making sure I got stuff done. And so I really started getting things done and it was a huge advantage because what we're doing with Freedom Tunes is one, sometimes two videos a week. And then I'm also working yeah. with clients and I'm managing a small team at this point and my animators are fantastic. But if it wasn't really instilled in me that you have to get your stuff done quickly, even if it's a passion project, even if you're being artsy about it, finished is better than perfect ultimately. And yeah. I think having that ingrained into me is really a huge part of what created myself and my brand and the things I've gone on to do. Yeah, that's the thing that's amazing about Ethan and Kyle is just the the amount of work just to push things out. Yeah, no, <laughs> Kyle does a lot. Yeah. And it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan, would you, did you have a moment where you realized animation would be like a thing you'd do? 
or like I remember were... starting like yeah I, I I do think that before I even could remember I I know that I liked I was fascinated by the idea of art and humor being one and mm-hmm. like always like, I wanted my humor well, I got into like Ninja Turtles and you know things being cool too but like I don't know I, I always had a fascination with art telling a story or being funny and so that was something that from the beginning I think I loved the idea you could draw pictures and make people laugh yeah were you ever like a funny guy though in class or are you more quiet like to where people was the humor? know me like that's the interesting thing about the podcast that's the closest to like if you know me well there's kind of two versions of me there's like there's subdued docile me where I just am not talking which is normal me but then the side of that side of it comes out that's on the podcast where I'm joking around and stuff you know, that's like probably what landed me my wife on our date. And she's my wife's pretty hot, but like I made her laugh a lot. So I have a funny side to me. That's why we evolved that adaptation. As yeah, well. I mean, you kind of have to. Exactly. It's all I got. So the looks aren't going to go. No, and never. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, but but I always loved expressing my humor through cartoons for sure. Did you did you have an animation program that you were using at first, or were you more of just on the well, writing? Cracks drawing? me up listening to this youngin. <laughs> So my whole life, what I really wanted to have was a camera with the cell and be able to, you know, oh, I oh, couldn't like the afford all that. Style, like I mean, I was pictures. raised like, yeah, I was raised in like low income housing and like, mm. uh, you know, the stuff they don't talk about where poor white, mm-hmm. you know, they don't talk about that. I've never heard of that. Was yeah, it exists. <laughs> Meth <laughs> land. Well, no, and uh, even just a video camera. Nobody, we couldn't have those. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. so just even wanted to use the click the camera, that kind of thing. So I had just tons of flip books. In fact, on my YouTube channel. You can see I, I, I compiled all of my flip books from age to like probably eight or nine till age 15 on this one video. And oh, I wow. Snapped all of my cell phone and uh, put them all together. I found out I had pretty good timing. It, all, it works pretty well. So how, always, how long would one of those take? Well, some of them I'd spend a week on because uh, I would draw a million different fights going on each page. So like yeah. it would just be this a whole brawl of people killing each other. That's challenging. So, and I will recommend this to everybody. Who's watching? If you go on Babel on B's YouTube page, there's what is it like, person versus geese or what's the oh, that? Was, oh. <laughs> that is that was, I, for old times' great. sake. I did that when I got a new animation program on my iPad. I did that. Yeah, that's hilarious, and it's but it's frame by frame. I mean, it's on your yeah, iPad, but you're not using frame. tweening or anything. Right, or any it's all purely just sketched. That is, uh, I'm not just it was saying called this. called a goose self defense. Or something yeah, like yeah, goose defense. Goose defense. Um, that it is one. Of, it's like one of the most technically proficient animations I've ever seen. I'm serious. <laughs> really? Thank yes. You. In terms of the actual hand drawn, it's very well done. It's really well done. Yeah, that's what I thought. But I have no yeah. where to base it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it's really good. So What's when it? I was like t- around ten, was when we got our first computer with an animation program mm-hmm. on it, and it was Autodesk Animator, I think. Hmm. And some guy handed it down to us. I met this rich guy who knew a Disney animator. And he wanted to help me out. And uh, I then I actually poured uh, orange juice all over the computer. <laughs> destroyed it. And that's so it when you Sunny knew D. you were destined to be an animator. <laughs> so it was the 90, it was like late 90s because it was Sunny D that I poured all over it. And that oh, was a big no. popular drink back then. Oh, man. In white that's trash rough. America. That is rough. But I, yeah, Flash I got into my late 20s. Hmm. Mid to, no, early 20s. Because you yeah. were starting out more as like a writer. Were you comic books before? You were doing comics really pretty animation? much my whole life. I wanted to do comics. I really wanted to do animation. It was around okay, probably around early high school where I went. You know what? I'm. You can't just uh, animation is so much work. I yeah. want to tell stories, so that's when I switched to comics. Mm. Were you into co- comics really before, or like like? I, were I was into Ninja Turtle comics. I didn't wasn't really into Marvel. Right. High school, I got into like indie comics, like black and white. Okay, yeah, because that was kind of like that was when comics weren't cool or anything either, too, right? Well, hold there on, was they're weird... not cool now. <laughs> yeah. they're not, yeah, well, they like, they were, like they are. they're profitable now, yeah. though. Like are back they? then, no, was, for sure. Yeah. I think it's interesting because I considered this at some points too. There were like larger animated projects I was working on that people would say like, oh, you should just try to convert this into a comic or a, a, a little yeah, children's book direction. or something like that. And I remember thinking, people have recommended this as well. Oh, with your political cartoons, why don't you just do panel cartoons? And there is something about creating motion and bringing characters to life on screen through that digital medium that t- to me is irreplaceable, especially when it comes to visual gags. Yeah. I mean, you just, you can't pull the same things off without motion that you can with motion. And there's a lot of talent that goes into creating comics and trying to communicate that motion with a single frame. I think there's something there that I don't want to understate right. yeah. or, or poo poo, but being able to have a character like deck another character in the face 
And then going through and determining, well, am I, is this going to take one frame or two frames of in-betweens or how quickly is it going to happen? And sort of adjusting that timing until you get something that's really funny is just, it's indispensable to me. I enjoy doing it so much that I don't think I could ever move to just doing comics. Yeah, right? like I feel like animation to me, like cause I, I've had more experience with like film, like live action, but like to me, animation is like the director's medium. Like you have so much control yes. over location to... The the act the, the characters' faces and everything. It's like you're not. It's almost like let. It's it's uh, more uh, working together with people, but you have so much more control over it in a way. It it is a director's medium. It is not a producer's medium. Because yeah. it is so expensive. <laughs> it is so expensive. I believe it was Andrew Stanton who said that we get nothing for free, mm. and that's true in animation. There's no prop that you can find to put yep. into your project. I mean, you, you can't get anything um, from the outside world. Everything has to be created on the spot for your production. Now, once you've built up- 3D animation, you like, we learned on VeggieTales is like- Yeah, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Really tight budgets, more tight than live action in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they would, because well, you guys would use shapes differently, right? Like if you had a boat, you could use it as like we would, something we else. We had a library we knew of props we already made because you only get like one new prop per episode or something like that. And so every joke would be marshmallows or lobsters or something that we already had that were inherently funny. <laughs> That's hilarious. Because we couldn't afford to just have a, a prop for a joke. Yeah. And that was yeah. a throwaway, you know. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. So with what we do on Freedom Tunes, there are libraries we end up building up. And, and usually those libraries are built up for characters specifically. So we have a couple characters who we'll reuse or base new models off of mm. so that we don't have to completely make a new rig from scratch every time. Mm -hmm. and. A lot of that is a huge part of animation that I think people don't realize. Yeah. A lot of what you're seeing in a low budget production had to be taken from elsewhere. So a lot of the heavier lifting happens early on when you just don't have those assets. Yeah, like, like you yeah. have to build a race, right? Yeah. Like a whole like yeah. oh, ethnicity of cartoon All characters. People, I don't know why you made it about race. That's a little yeah. weird. <laughs> but you do have to create this entire universe from scratch and then you sort of try to reuse things. So again, with, with political cartoons, there are some sets you have that you can use over and over again. So the White House, the Oval right. Office, that kind of thing. But the news cycle has been so bizarre over the past year or so that you can never predict what's coming. And we just end up having to create these new settings all the time for <laughs> things that no one could have anticipated would be in the news cycle. Yeah. So like, I was gonna ask too, cause I was interested, cause you two both have like very different drawing styles. Mm -hmm. Did you guys have like an influence of that or is that just how you naturally drew really? Cause like, like a shame as I've seen yours is almost like kind of miniature people, I guess in a yeah, way. Yeah. And then like Ethan's is almost a little more like to scale. Like do you guys like, did, was that a conscious decision or is that just how you naturally draw? That's a good question. So I was very strongly influenced by Peanuts as a kid mm. and also by The Simpsons as well. So mm. it's almost kind of a weird blending yeah, of those yeah. two styles maybe. But it's not as if there was ever a conscious decision as to go, these are going to be little people. I just think that there is something inherently cartoony about like short little yeah. fat characters. And in some ways they can be easier to animate than having like a full size. Yeah, know, it's kind of like bigger heads and everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like more yeah. about their so reaction. More of the emphasis is on the face, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Did you have a conscious decision in it or is that kind of just naturally I mean, that's the thing, uh, we've done a couple styles uh, on the, the animation. There's been a lot of experimenting in the animation here at the Babylon <laughs> Bee. Um, that's one of the interesting thing I look at with Envy at years, there's more vision behind it, but I've been going so much longer than mm -hmm. I have. Um, but yeah, I think, Probably what influenced my the styles we've been sticking with lately was that I had done a bunch of character designs for Rick and Morty. Uh, what not, you had? Not hired. I tried to as like a tryout. Like, oh. were, like the job was open. Hmm. I was trying to get another job. Which is, you know, in case, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> so I submitted like the, they have you like do like twenty different drawings of character to like this huge packet of character mm -hmm. designs. So I had never drawn in that style as I was trying it. So I had it. I just I think I had that style in my head when I those together so they do I, I get that accused of that a lot like oh rick and morty rip off oh really yeah yeah, yeah I, I was literally it. saying that's him before we started rolling oh i didn't even notice that yeah that's why yeah, i can kind of <laughs> see it now that you say it i can kind of see yeah uh, like that I mean, it's of. just to me the moment you put circles and ovals and stuff they all look it's just you know yeah a lot of really that, simple yeah. geometric shapes and it, it all starts to blend together in a weird way it's we almost kind of have this american anime style going yeah. i think it's there's sort of an overlap between what we're doing and shows like 
Family Guy or Rick and Morty, where there is this sort of tried and true template that people just kind of replicate and tweak a little bit to fit their production. Yeah, it's like not the South Park had like the real simple one mm -hmm. and like Simpsons sort of kind of brought probably a lot of what, what most Simpsons of them has are. more of their own style with yeah. the yellow and, mm -hmm. and, that's, and things. It's pretty cool. Yeah, well, that's part of what I hate so much about the new Simpsons. I mean, and by oh, new, yeah. I mean everything for the past 20 years. <laughs> so maybe not just new, but early on, their designs were so fascinating to me. Mm. And what I there's a, a web series I create for the Foundation for Economic ah, the Foundation for Economic Education called Common Sense Soapbox. And one of the things I love about that series is we do kind of get like wild with the character designs. There's mm. a very basic template, but we like to give them crazy hair and weird facial expressions, weird facial hair as well, uh, strange outfits if we can. I don't think that's being done. Yeah. very often anymore and and that's there's definitely inspiration i've taken from the simpsons there so i i really do miss that now their characters i mean you can tell what era a simpsons create uh, oh, character yeah. was created in just by looking at them hmm. yeah i felt sad when even like sometimes i go to south park and when the really good animation came in it felt kind of dirty in a way because i liked yeah. <laughs> i liked when it was like just a really bouncing around and simple kind of way they, they had in the very beginning well so part of the appeal and i've said this before i have to say this every time i bring it up and we said it on the show last time that part of what's disappointing for i think me as a catholic and just you guys as christians generally and you as a catholic mm -hmm. as well is that they have such brilliant political satire but some of it's just so filthy that you can't yeah. watch yeah. it but part of the brilliance of South Park early on was when you watched it, it felt like something you could make. Yeah. So the viewer at home would watch this and think, oh, this is kind of something that I would put together if I was able to. There was this accessibility within the style that just didn't exist anywhere else. And now that's not so much the case. They still do what they can to I make know. it look like it's made out of paper mache, but everyone knows it's CG it's at this point. Mm -hmm. But in, in reality, the only episode to be done fully in CG of the official series was the first episode. Everything after the first episode. Paper. Yeah. yeah well, well, actually, I'm sorry, actually done with papers the first Cut episode. Yeah. Everything else after that was CG, but they did a really good job making it appear simple enough. Yeah. So that it still seemed as if it was made. So it's like the joke paper. was how bad it looked. Mm -hmm. I think was kind of a, a funny way, and that's how they were able to be taken seriously because they were they knew they were that bad. Well, that's the only way to get that thing done in a week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's only, well, with writing. Because you, have you seen the documentary about? I know that they do them all in a week, but it's interesting because early on they did a lot of that week like, is writing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, that's something that shocked me about that documentary is like. They're, they're like it's like they're fat over halfway through the week and they're still they're yeah, just they're starting just, to hand off the script. These guys are just w sleeping in the office waiting to be given what to the crazy animate thing, for three man. days. Well, and it's interesting because a lot of it is again just having a built up library and reusing the yeah. things. They have the same main characters and they'll bring celebrities into lampoon or new mm -hmm. characters, but they reuse a lot of the same assets. And part of what we do with Freedom Tunes again, uh, much shorter videos than South Park does, much lower budget also though, so go easy on us, is we create a video every week and sometimes two a week, and often it is created the week that we're releasing it. So two, we released two videos last week and both of those videos were made the day before we released them. Man. And that was crazy to pull off. The reason it was possible is because I have the best team on the planet. <laughs> I've said this before, in terms of low budget animation, I genuinely think I'm running the best, most efficient studio for what we're able to so, churn out in the amount of time that we have. It's, but those and, are and 22 it's, minutes, I'm just saying. No, 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 <laughs> of course, no, no, 100%. I mean, what South yeah. Parker's doing is unfathomable. 22 yeah. minutes in a week is, it's, it's insane. It's, okay, I can't wrap yeah. my head around it. I don't know how yeah. many people I would need to do that. I don't know what kind yeah. of budget I would it's need to do that. Crazy. Crazy, yeah. uh, and so that's part of why they go for like 10 weeks and then don't, up yeah, don't, don't because, go they back. Die, yeah. <laughs> because they would die 22 yeah. minutes of an even if it's very simple animation 22 minutes a week that's crazy and especially when like you said they're just why writing, some writing, of the writing. Suck. yeah <laughs> <laughs> when they kind of fall apart at the yeah. end or something yeah, yeah. They, they definitely knew that too yeah. it's like but that's actually something interesting i've been noticing in your video seamus is like you're almost always the only writer credited is that like was that a conscious decision or is that like a time yeah. decision sort of thing? It's it's a little bit of both. So there have been different seasons in production. And for a little while, uh, I would have like animators would just pitch jokes to me more often. It's just happened to be the case that lately I've been writing all of these. There was, I think, a period of time about two years ago where more jokes were, were being pitched to me by people who work for me. And it's, it's not as if I just stop taking their ideas. It's right. just there's a rotation of the people you work with over time, especially on a low budget production. And I also think that I changed, my writing style has changed over the years too. And 
I think a lot of what I write, there are, there are many things I write that I know are only going to be funny once they're visualized. Mm. Like it's really hard. And I'm sure you're familiar with this doing animation. Like there are some things that they're really funny in your head, but if you write it out on paper, no one's going to get it. You just have yeah. to make it. Yeah. And so it can be difficult having writing partners, especially non-animator writing partners, when so many of your jokes function that way. Not all of them, but like a good enough number. And so it, it's mostly been me. I wouldn't say entirely for that reason, though, that probably contributes. I think a lot of it has just been a need to get these things done quickly, not having much time yeah. to bounce things off of another writer, and also a, a desire to keep the stuff relatively consistent. Yeah, it feels like that way. I mean, Ethan and our, our writer, Erluck <laughs> Weinstein. <laughs> Erluck Weinstein. <laughs> um, he what, disguises his name. Yeah, like he, he almost writes almost all of it. Yeah. And then you, but you kind of have more of the executive role in a way. Do you? Do there's you have, a lot of them. We'll, yeah. Me and him will sit down and smoke a cigar and we'll come up with ideas. And there's a number of ideas. He, he came with it or I did, or sometimes Kyle did. You know, like a number of them. I mean, I, the concept was my idea and we'd come up with all the beats together, but he's just a master of getting it all down mm. on paper fast, yeah. which I struggle with. I sit there and I'll lay on the floor and then I'll drink <laughs> yeah. I'll spend a cigar and I just pace because it's so, it drives my mind nuts that there's all these options yeah. on I know. the page and I'm, I'm committing to one and he's really good at just going for it. Yeah, yeah like, because you, you, you kind of like say an idea is good or not. Do you have like a thing where you, or is it more of like just, you know it when you see it, it's good? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, mm. I know when I see it. I don't know. It, no, it's interesting. I, I experienced the same thing. Even the day that I'm uploading early in the morning, I'll get an idea for a gag. And then I think, mm. is this going to work? Do I have time <laughs> to put this in? So we did a video a little while ago where um, it was about the gas crisis and the fact checkers yeah, coming in now. and saying there is no. And the video ends with them pouring gasoline on him, lighting him on fire and going, talk about gaslighting. Like after they spent the whole time like gaslighting him psychologically. <laughs> yeah. And that joke came to me like maybe two hours before I uploaded. Wow. The, I can't even remember what the original punchline is. But then I went outside to take a brief walk. And as I was walking, because I, I just needed to relax, I, I pulled an all-nighter basically and then woken up really early to finish it. It's like, all right, I need to just take a walk. And when I'm done, I'll go back home, put one or two finishing touches on and upload it. And then while I'm walking, I get this idea and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> like I have to do this. I can't not use this gag now that it's coming to me because it's a better ending. Yeah. And so I just like texted a couple friends to bounce it off of them, which which I do. Again, I don't have writing partners, but I have a couple friends who I will just like neurotically lambast with mm. uh, with messages or maybe lambast yeah. is the wrong word, but just inundate with these do you th What about this gag or, or do you think this script is funnier? So I'll, I'll seek feedback from people I know can get back to me quickly. And so I was just messaging them, what about, is this funnier? And then asking my animators, what do you think is funnier? And everyone seemed to agree that punchline was better. So then I just sat there and put it together with like the hour and a half that I had and we got the thing up, finished and uploaded, so. <laughs> yeah, that's the most, to me, like trying to do some writing is feedback is like, mm -hmm. seems to be the thing that keeps me out of the void. Like the void of just like, Myself to bounce off is like the hardest thing. Like that gets me held up the most. And quality feedback yeah. is hard Priceless. to find yeah. because mm -hmm. I have gotten some horrible feedback yeah. over yeah. the years. And there are certain videos that had I listened to the feedback I was receiving would have just bombed. They wouldn't have been good. Mm. And so it's, it's a mixed bag. You have to have people you really trust. And even it, it happens where... Sometimes really funny people who write really funny jokes give really bad feedback. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I've had it happen before. And so there are people who I respect as writers who I think are very funny, but they just won't get your vision for a particular thing or it, mm -hmm. it doesn't quite fit their style so they don't like it. And you have to just be confident with your own vision. You yeah. have to be able to say, okay, this guy's funny and I respect him, but that doesn't mean he's the end all be all. And that doesn't mean he's right about whether this gag is funny. I'm gonna go with it if you really believe it is. Yeah. That's tricky. And then, yeah, when it comes to writing, there will be a, a video I'm writing and there's like five or six different videos it can become. You, know, you have like a nugget of an idea and you start writing out the beginning and then you have like five or six different directions you can take it in. And it stinks because it's, it's hard to come up with an idea. But then once you come up with an idea, you come up with five videos for it, but you can only choose uh, one. Yeah. And so you go from having an absence to an abundance and now you've got to pick the one that works best in... It's, it can be a lot of pressure too right. when you want to make sure that you're doing the funniest possible thing for your audience. 
Well, I feel like the time constraint for both of you know Battle mm -hmm. and B and Freedom Tunes is really helpful too because it does mm -hmm. force you to move faster. I yeah, think. Mm -hmm. for sure. How yeah. often do you guys release? Like once a month? About we're about we bet we were doing once a week for a while there. We uh, it's more like every other week now. Yeah, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's more than once a month. It's for sure. It's every two, at least every two weeks. Every two weeks. Yeah, I was strolling through uh, yesterday and it, it seemed like there was some space between them, so I wasn't sure. But you guys also don't only upload animation. That's the thing. You guys yeah, have a little true. more breathing be, room. Yeah, and last, I think that's last year you've been slower. Yeah, well, some have been a little more complicated. And it's not bad. And we had a book. We I just said the studies are working on a book suddenly and like drop some animation, so. Yeah, I mean, that's not bad, especially because on your channel, you guys have a pretty consistent stream of content coming from other avenues. It isn't all animated, yeah, some of it is the no podcast. Yeah. And so that gives you the advantage of maybe being able to take a little longer on a specific video, which isn't bad. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that, that can be a very good thing, like the one you guys just released about uh, A Quiet Place 2. Mm -hmm. yeah. I thought it was really funny, and the thing about it is it was relevant but it wasn't like this week's news cycle relevant. It was something you could yeah. foresee because that's a movie that's going to come out and then make good gags. I think that's a really good strategy. Yeah, that one worked out for us. <laughs> do, you, yeah. do you guys ever think about things that can be more like, like can we call a little bit like evergreen kind of things here, like animations? Like have you done any of those with Freedom? Because yours a lot seem of, mostly, a lot of them seem like they're very timely as well. But. Over the last year or so, but before this last year, a lot of the stuff was evergreen and I still try to like, splice between evergreen content so at least at least one video a month sometimes two will be pretty evergreen mm -hmm. and those do not do as well as the others on the date of release but in the long run they mm -hmm. tend to outperform them mm -hmm. so we did a couple i think over this last month maybe maybe in may or june we did a few that were not about that week's events mm -hmm but I thought had staying power. So we did one on like why boomers ruined everything. Right. That's the one I'm thinking of now. And that's just going to be relevant for as long as boomers are here and being yeah. talked about. And so it's a mixed bag. It is a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. And I have a bunch that are written that are evergreen, but as soon as they go into production, something crazy happens and it's like, we have to cover this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I do like the evergreen stuff. The other thing though, is that with the evergreen projects, it always, it, it feels like there's more pressure Mm -hmm. Because if you're doing something that has to be relevant to this week's news cycle, you really force yourself to move quickly and you take more risks because you're saying, I have to get this done. But when it's evergreen, you think, all right, well, this is less disposable as video. People are going to be watching this for longer. Yeah. So I'm going to be really selective about I the jokes. The and it kind of cripples you. video about this joke, right? Yes. Like, yeah. Pressure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, do you guys, because I, because... Like, that's where I feel like the doubt can come in a lot more. Like, do you guys have, like, a way to move past the doubt on those? No. Especially, like, evergreen jokes. No, like, just, no, there's no... Cause it's, yeah. That's the game. Yeah. Well, I think that the trick <laughs> Make is... Make it, release it, and see what happens. Like, that's well, the exciting part about it. The, and the important thing is that when you are making content that is timely, you still have to have jokes that are not. Right. So people have to be able to go back and watch and say, well, this is funny because this character's actions were stupid or this was a decent slapstick bit and not, well, I don't remember this event, so this means nothing to me. Yeah. Which I think is probably more likely to happen with very verbally heavy humor, mm. which is what I used to do more of. And now a lot of the stuff, there's a lot of verbal stuff, but a huge portion of it is just trying to create funny animated visual gags. Yeah, like I remember hearing some, I think it was Matt Growing, The Simpsons, I think it was the, the guy from The Simpsons mm, grainy, talked yeah. about like, um, if it's if it can't be, if it can be done in live action, why do it in animation? Yes, amen, mm -hmm. yeah. I completely agree. I yeah. completely agree. Which I feel like you guys have done mostly with, with everything here. Like I can't imagine any of the Babylon B animations. Like well, and, action, or Axe Cop. Or Axe Cop, Yeah, yeah no, sure. seriously. It's... Well, the KKK one, but it's hard to get a lot of guys to dress up in the KKK outfits. Well, it sounds like there's a little bit separation, <laughs> yeah. But, but that is actually something that still works a lot better in animation, not just because you can't get people to dress up like that, but there's a world of difference between seeing an actual Klansman right. and seeing a cartoon of they're a Klansman. They're more Klansman. sympathetic as a cartoon. Yes, yeah. they're more approachable, much yeah, like, more approachable. Heard, yeah, Bill Burr was even saying, he's like, I can't get live people to yell at kids, but it's like, I can do it in animation. <laughs> That's <laughs> so a good point. Yeah, it's like, true, yeah, it's true. A little easier. <laughs> yes, yeah, so there are certain things that may be seemingly mundane in animation or could be possible in live action, but it still works better animated. Mm. And this, again, this is one thing the South Park guys have talked about. Trey Parker and Matt Stone have said, 
you could not kill an eight-year-old every week on a TV yeah. show and have people <laughs> laugh at it. But yeah. with animation, especially if you have a style of simplistic is there, the, the more iconic your visuals are, the more the easier it is to get away with doing those kinds of things. Mm. Yeah, do you do you guys feel like, because I know you said South Park is like, you, you, like Ethan's described as wanting to take a shower afterwards, mm. but do you guys feel like you have like lines that you don't want to cross in animation in a way? Yeah. Because both of you have done sure. very violent things, but it, there is like... Definitely a certain line I feel like you guys don't exactly cross. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the South Park guys famously say that nothing's sacred, and mm -hmm. I don't think they buy that. I don't think anybody really believes nothing is sacred. There's yeah. a line that they won't cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, they clearly believe that free speech is sacred. Right. Yeah. So, so there is something sacred to them. Mm -hmm. I think, for me, the lines that I won't cross are generally those dealing with sexuality and sexual humor. I'm very careful about that. I definitely don't like having any kind of nudity in the cartoons. And part of it is because I believe that sex is sacred and it's been so degraded in our culture that I don't want to further contribute to that. And so people will say, how come jokes about violence are okay and jokes about sex aren't? And there's a few reasons for that. I think a violent joke absolutely can go too far, be too gross. And at that point, it's unacceptable. But violence is not this beautiful thing that's been degraded by our culture. It's a fundamentally <laughs> nasty thing. And one of the important utilities of comedy is to help us cope with the more troubling realities of life. And so having this over-the-top goofy slapstick achieves that perfectly. But making sexuality ridiculous on screen and further degrading our mm -hmm. cultural consciousness surrounding it, to me, isn't what I want to use my comedy yeah. for. Right, yeah, it, exactly. It, making light of sex has an impact on the culture yes. differently than making, not making light of violence in the sense of, if you make like an over-the-top gore fest movie mm -hmm. that's silly where a guy's got like, you know, his fans are replaced with chainsaws mm -hmm. and he's, it's just, no one's, who's going to imitate that? Yeah, right? well, and, and that's the thing, even like with that kind of gratuitous gore, I generally don't watch that stuff. Is And part of it is just because once you let oh, something Oh yeah, I guess I'm really saying why I, would, I have a more but of a I get problem. what you're saying. No, yeah. I get what you're saying. Well, and another thing too is that Outside of the context of comedy, there are still reasons why it's more acceptable to show violent content than sexual content. And one of the reasons is because violent content is more possible to simulate where there mm. is certain sexual content you just can't. So if a woman gets naked on screen, that is literally actually a woman right. getting naked on screen. That's not right. simulated. That's really happening. That person is really committing that sin. Mm -hmm. Whereas when it comes to violence, you can have violence in a film, and again, I believe that can become gratuitous and sinful, but it can be simulated. <laughs> you don't gotta murder you, you don't actually, You don't actually have to kill somebody. And on top of that, I believe showing sexuality, and not necessarily in a comedic context, but showing sexuality in a film will be more likely in my mind to tempt people to sexual thoughts and behaviors. I believe that somebody will see an attractive woman behaving immodestly on screen and they'll become aroused and then they'll mm. wrestle with those temptations or, or they'll sin. Whereas I don't think somebody sees someone get killed in a movie and then begins to desire to kill people. Right. I'm not saying it can never happen. If you're watching a propaganda piece and the purpose of it is to really rile you up and make you oppose mm -hmm. a specific enemy and want to hurt them, of course seeing violence on screen can tempt you to violent, angry thoughts. I just think it's much easier to navigate that than it is to navigate showing something sexual on screen without tempting people to sexual thoughts or behaviors. Yeah, it's like violence, you're, it's escapism and you're creating a fantasy, mm. but with sexual stuff, you're making the fantasy a reality, at least in the studio. You yeah, know? yeah, it's true. You can't yeah. fake it. So yeah, it's yeah. different. Do you guys see like, too, like, because what you're talking about too, I was thinking how like comedy, of some, like, Laughter is so hard for me to kind of really analyze because it's so many different mm. things. But like one of them is like being like relief from something that you thinking. Do you guys think about that when you're like writing or is it comedy is more instinctual to you that whether it's funny or not? Or is there just kind of like, oh, this will be like a, a relief to somehow a lot of people are feeling about like Joe Biden or mm. some certain situation. Like is there does those thoughts kind of cross your mind during it? I'm not the analytical empathy. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a tough Play one. So you. when <laughs> I first started doing Freedom Tunes, and I imagine this is probably true of most people when they start writing comedy, I was writing comedy that I knew was funny in some sense, but not the stuff that made me laugh the hardest. Mm -hmm. And now the stuff I write is really stuff that I do laugh at and enjoy. And it's not to say I didn't laugh at or enjoy the other stuff, but it, it just isn't what I would seek out. 
Mm. And so a huge part of my growth has been figuring out how to put something on screen that I would really want to see if I were going into a blind. Like what is the funniest thing mm. I could make that if I, as a first time viewer saw, would really laugh at? Uh, I don't quite think about it that analytically in the moment, but I know that that's sort of where my subconscious has moved as I've evolved in my comedy writing. I think that in terms of what the purpose of comedy or laughter is, that's really complicated. Yeah. I used to say in the past that, and I alluded to this earlier, it's essentially a coping mechanism. Mm. I think that might be a little simplistic. I think there's something more to it that works as a rough analysis. But for me, the stuff I laugh at the hardest is the stuff that just makes you go, why? Like, why <laughs> would someone do that? That is hilarious to me. When a character <laughs> just does something completely absurd and stupid on screen, like I'm a sucker for that. I just mm -hmm. think it's hilarious. Yeah, and like I feel like too, it's like, like that's, that's one thing I think uh, that comes up a lot too is having like that straight man, like someone to hold mm -hmm. on to reality wise too. Mm -hmm. Helps a lot too. I've heard like, that kind of the old thing of having the crazy and the straight man. Yes. And I feel like that that is necessary because you have to feel like you're in that character. Like that's what I've come around to a lot is feeling connection to characters and mm. things too. With as a more of written, it's like less of like they're outside of reality in a way. Because you need someone to hold on to to be reacting to the craziness that's going on. I think there's truth in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's truth in that. But sometimes you can just go full out absurd and it's really funny just have no straight man <laughs> in the entire thing. And I don't know how well that works for something that might be feature length, but for animated shorts, you can just have everyone be really ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in the current political climate, that's yeah. advantageous because you find yourself needing to portray things that way pretty often. Oh, yeah. Have you guys ever thought about doing things outside of comedy in a way. Like I know Ethan, I just finished reading Brave Alley Possum. That has, yeah. definitely has jokes in it, mm -hmm. but it has a wholesome story in a way yeah, too. It's a, like it's a fantasy but, children's story. Yeah, like do you do you want to do more of that kind of thing in like the feature length or show world or? I love action movies. I'd love to write an action movie. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I lo I'd love to do more books like Ollie. Uh, yeah, I love writing stories. It's just, it's laborious for me. I don't crank it out fast. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it, I get it. Yeah. Well, do you ever find, too, what will happen with me is I'll come up with a premise for a story that I'm really excited about, and I'll start writing it down, but then it's so hard to actually get the beats onto the yeah. page mm, and flesh yeah. it out into yeah, something. That's, that's labor. That's re that, Exactly. That's where the labor comes in. Mm -hmm. When I'm animating or doing scripts, it's easier for me to just churn something out really quickly, but when this is a story that is more serious and not as comedically based and... I have to do more work within it than than just making jokes or just expressing a point through humor, then it's definitely a lot more laborious. And yeah. I, I would say that I have, yeah, I have a lot of story ideas. I have an idea for a children's film uh, that I've been wanting to produce for a while. I'd like to flesh it out a bit more. I mm. think it would be a good animated film. And it's not like bust a gut hilarious. Obviously, there's comedic elements in it, but it's, it's probably something a little more stern. Mm. Yeah, because I know you've had a lot in the development world, and you've seen how that's gone, mm. kind of gone too. Like, do is there any like like desire to go back into that with something like Brave Valley Possum and the, like trying to make that into like a film? Or I would love. I mean, to me, I think in film. So like, for, that's very that's why you know, I did over over hundred drawings for that book, or over two hundred, because uh, I'm very visual and and in my mind, that's the perfect Disney film or Pixar film. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would love to. But I mean, yeah, with the right company, that's one thing I realized when I was at DreamWorks, there's real paranoia at that place and they play it so safe that their mm. stuff is coming out so bad. Mm. Uh, yeah. That'll kill you. Yeah, yeah, it's rough. And I've suffered from that too, believe it. I mean, I know that the stuff I do isn't necessarily tame, though I think we're pretty, like PG, at worst PG-13. Yeah. But then there are, there are some gags where you wonder, like, is this going to be interpreted this way? And people... Mm -hmm be upset by this or this will like destroy the career of myself and the people working on this. You can get yeah. in your head with that stuff, but the audience can almost sense your fear. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, they, like and I, I remember hearing from Eli Roth, he had a cool thing where he said when he first started, he was like, you realize most people in Hollywood, they it's not that they want to succeed, they just don't want to fail. Like they always want to go <laughs> like, I, I, how could I have known? Like yeah. that was, I did everything possible. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have to almost take the risk in order to even get to close to succeeding. Exactly. And th there have been a few times in the past where there, I, I think there were like one or two videos that I really wanted to do. And, but in the moment I thought like, well, maybe I shouldn't. 
And in part, it was because I didn't have all the facts about the situation, so maybe it was prudent. Mm. But then in retrospect, it turned out when more facts came out that I was still absolutely correct. And <laughs> I just kicked myself over it. So whenever I have all the information and I think it would be prudent to do a video, even if it's offensive, I, I still just go for it because I have regretted the videos I didn't make more yeah. than I've ever regretted something that I did make. Mm. Yeah, I totally always feel like it's like being wrong isn't always <clears throat> the worst thing in the world either. Mm -hmm. Like, right. you can always, like... You were going off the information that you had at the time. Mm -hmm. But but that also brings up another thing I was thinking, because I know you've worked with Tim Poole recently, too, yeah. in voice acting. Do you? Oh, he's great. Have you, because a lot of your videos have been you, voice actor, and then do you like, have like a stream of voice actors that you work with? That's a good question. So for female voice actors, there is a woman named Britta. She runs a Twitter account called No Soup for Noel. She's very talented. I use her. She did, I used her on like one or two. Yeah, you guys have used her as well, and I told her that she needs to stop immediately. <laughs> <laughs> but she's very talented, so I use her usually when I need a female voice. Sometimes my friend Liberty, uh, whose wedding I was just at yesterday, oh. as a matter of fact, will we'll do voices her for name me. Is Liberty? Yeah, her name is Liberty, and she got married on the 4th of July. <laughs> you know, uh, she had to. Of course. Uh, and so she'll do voices sometimes, and... I would say beyond that, it's mostly me. Michael Knowles has been great too. Oh, wow, he's really? done a couple voices. Yes, he's good. He's really good. I was surprised by how well, well he, he could out voice acting, act. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He still is. He doesn't believe any of his opinions <laughs> when he's on the show. I, I've talked to him behind the scenes. And he's like, no. It's all an act. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, no, he's actually super cool. I just did his show a couple weeks ago, oh, and it's cool. going to be coming out hmm. in a few days. Yeah, he's he, and he is, of course. I was kidding. The same off camera, but yeah. I think. Ultimately, I did the voices initially just out of necessity. And then as the channel really grew, even though I had access to a larger talent pool, it was still a necessity for me to do the voices because we had to do them really quickly. And I mentioned to you, I came up with a different ending for one of my videos mm -hmm. and then I had to do it within two hours. And yeah. you can't wait on another voice actor yeah, yeah. to do something like that. And so... I've basically done all of them. But yeah, I've been surprised. Like Michael Knowles is a really good voice actor and Tim Poole is a really good voice he's actor. Great. He is Fauci, he's fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed him. And, and he yeah. and him, he and I actually improved um a, a couple videos right after that that I'm excited to release. They're oh, really cool. funny. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a funny guy. <laughs> yeah, he seemed like he really held his own, especially like just, just coming in. I didn't even recognize his voice. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I expected to be really fast talking and fast paced, and he yeah. really slowed it down for him. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know Ethan, like, reading, like, going Brave Valley Possum, the voices are like. Oh yeah, crazy! Man. I did the audio book, <laughs> like amazing. So, <laughs> Thank you. were you always doing voices like when you were younger too? Was that kind of like a thing for you? Yeah, I just lived in cartoon world. It was my it was my world. So mm -hmm. yeah, just voices and facial expressions, and to me that was just natural. Mm -hmm. My dad was like that too. He was very expressive and mm -hmm. silly faces and stuff. Yeah, because I remember you told me how, and I read in the, your blog too about your dad would like take you out and like tell story. Was it all when he was telling stories and like the van with you guys? My dad was homeless, so he didn't have he didn't have books around to like uh -huh. read to us a bedtime story. So he just like make up a story on the spot, and it wasn't brilliant. It was usually something like about farting or throwing mashed potatoes in each other's face. That is just, brilliant, <laughs> and I Dude, loved I love it. That, yeah. and to me, it was like you just made a story, and it didn't exist, and now it's here. And we laughed our butts wow. off yeah, with the story. Yeah, yeah. I was just like blown away by it, and that, that's something I told my dad, like because my dad just passed. I'm sorry, and. Uh, you know, I sat with him at his deathbed and I told him, you know, I, I read him this blog where I said, you know, because he told me he used to just cry, to, cry himself to sleep at night in his van because he thought he was just a failure to us and oh. he had nothing to, uh, to offer us of any value. And he left us, you know, he just he just left it around when I was like 12. He just I'm moved sorry. away. And, uh, you know, and, and I don't even think it dawned on him that like the gift that he gave me when he just sat there and made stories up hmm. uh, on the spot and... Uh, I was even like the stupidest thing ever. I remember he made some dad joke about the about Smokey the Bear, mm. uh, the song Smokey the Bear, Smokey. He did a song. He just like started making up a like a weird owl spoof of it called Smoking a Bear, and about what you know, how you, they're hard to light, but you can <laughs> smoke them anyway or whatever. He just started making up a song about smoking bears, and I thought I wrote a full like ten. Ten verse version of it. I was so excited. Oh, man. So that and it's, uh, that's yeah. literally your comedy distilled yeah. into yeah. one story. Smoking Stupid a bear. Stupid smoking a bear. Yeah. yeah. Do you? Do you? How much? Influence? His book bears. Oh, bears to kill you. Kill you. Oh yeah. my. <laughs> Dude, that's it's brilliant. 
Yeah, like, how much influence do you think that had on you, too? Because, I mean, I, I remember the moment when my dad told me in a Star Trek episode, he's like, somebody writes him walking through the door. Like, <laughs> like how much of that influence he was like an artist, like him making mm. up stories and like sharing like that could actually I think happen. it was just like a general attitude of it's okay to be a weirdo. Mm. My family was always okay with just being weird and off kilter. And I look back through some of my Amen, sketchbooks yeah. and my mom... Never said really, she never really got upset or like tried to stop me. And I had some crazy crap in my sketchbook. <laughs> <I> <laughs> like had, things like, she should have called a counselor over. No, Frank, literally. Like. <laughs> I had like gunfights in the school hallways, but I just thought gunfights were cool. <laughs> There's just like students like shooting each other. Oh, and, to me, it was just like I like John Woo, and I thought, wouldn't that be funny in a school hallway? But this is before Colum kind of Columbine was one of the first big, not before Columbine, it was uh. In Eugene, mm. uh, Thurston, there's kind of the... Oh, that's kind of, I mean, semi-close. That was right, right, two hours from us. It was yeah, so was close horrible. to home, and that was one of the first massive big media ones. Uh, but that was before. I mean, I was, I was like, late, like in senior in high school or something. So mm. Yeah, but I feel like at that time, too, it's like... Be like you were just, so you're innocent just a kid before that. Yeah, yeah, just goofing off. Yeah. And what's interesting how things affect children. I was six when 9 11 happened, and I remember it. And I remember, of course, being a horrible you're thing. You're so much younger than yeah. I am. Yeah, no. six. You're six. Uh, yeah, I, I was six. And, but one of my, oh my friends was oh, I dumped my life. at an other school. And <laughs> he's like ahead of me. And he's like, <laughs> I don't know about that. You've had stuff on television. Axe Cop was true. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I seriously know I loved Axe Cop. It looked Axe successful. Cop. I looks. loved Axe Cop. <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember a friend of mine telling me this story later. But as a kid, the teacher turned on the television and was showing them. And so for a while, he was just drawing airplanes hitting buildings because Whoa. he didn't like understand the emotional impact that had on people. It was just something he saw as a kid mm. and wanted to imitate. Mm. And so, yeah, it's it's just interesting how... Children will see things in a way and they'll be influenced by things very differently than an adult will when it's the same oh, event. Yeah. And in some situations, like the, the one I just described, it's very morbid. But mm -hmm. in other situations, like the one with your father where he's just telling you these stories and not thinking much of them, it can have an incredible impact. And I mm -hmm. think that's yeah. a huge part also of why adults need to be very, very careful in terms of what they say to children or around children because you totally. can affect them in ways that you would never possibly understand. Yeah. And it's also a reason why people creating content aimed at children have an unfathomable responsibility to be as careful as they can with it. Oh, yeah. And unfortunately, what a lot of children's content is being used for is pushing the gay agenda. Mm -hmm. Like you look at this Blue's yeah. Clues stuff and you have a drag queen singing to kids about the pride parade and yeah. it's horrible. Yeah, like I remember in middle school, I guess I used to sub middle, for middle school a, a few uh, before COVID and like, Kids would just be repeating things they saw in cartoons, mm -hmm. like constantly. Yeah. And I was like, they have no idea what they're even saying. Mm -hmm. It was only from like Shrek. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, like, it's interesting. Do you, do you guys think about like the the attitude that comes with that, like with kids and everything? Like, cause I guess most of your content has been more like adult mm -hmm. centered, but there is definitely kids probably still watching your guys' stuff as well. That could be true. Yeah, I definitely like... I don't encourage kids to watch and it's political. So I think it's assumed that this is for adults or at least like older teenagers. And when I break down my demographics, there are very, very few actual kids, if any, watching. But I still try to make it in a way so that, you know, if a, a kid saw it, they wouldn't be horribly traumatized or come away from it um, with a warped sense yeah. of reality. Then that's part of, I mean, part of it is, again, we don't really talk about sex or joke about sex. And when we do... For example, we'll like, you know, we might take a quote from a politician right. like Joe Biden saying something weird about sex and, and put that in there. But that's about as far as we ever go. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, it's just like really goofy and slapsticky. So like if a kid does stumble across it, they're not going to come away yeah. from it scarred in some right. way. And also the more adult things that are in it are more verbally based. Right. So the kids aren't going to like they're not going to know what we, what even transpired in the video. Oh, for sure. Yeah, because I know this in Brave Valley Possum, it gets pretty, there's a lot of horror thing, but it's, children's horror is kind of even like a weird Yeah, I tried to walk that line. I really wanted it to be legitimately scary. Because mm -hmm. I I read a bunch of bi uh, bedtime stories to my kids, and I know like the, the things that made a bedtime story really good. Like one was that you legitimately get scared, but mm -hmm. also that you legitimately laugh. Like there's yeah. funny, fun voices to do uh, was a big one. Characters that are fun to read. Yeah. Um, and then also uh, gross descriptions. Like you did bring a really gross description that gets a reaction. <laughs> yeah, so like stuff the, like that. Like <laughs> yeah, that was great. So I try to work all that kind of stuff in. And I also like I love the motif of a 
human getting turned into an animal and that the animals having their own world he discovers. I really wanted to play with that. And then the monster, over the top, rolled doll kind of monster. Mm. So I had a blast making that. That's very interesting. There's something I kind of want to dive into there just about children's media. And I mentioned that children's creators have a, a huge duty in saying this is somebody who's not a children's content creator. They, they have a grave duty yeah. to make things that won't mess with kids' heads. But on the other hand, we shelter kids from a lot. Yeah. And so it can be difficult to know what line to walk. It seems to me as if most children's entertainment gives you the worst of both worlds where they're not sheltering them from the realities they should probably be sheltering them from. They're not sheltering them from uh, deviant forms of sexuality, but they are sheltering them from the fact that they have flaws. A lot of yeah. children's media is just about being yourself mm -hmm. and accepting who you are. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but sometimes you have problems. Right. And kids yeah. should know from a young age that they need to fix themselves or work on themselves totally. in some ways. And yeah. so we have, we have children's media, which, which does the exact opposite of what children's media should do ideally. But going to what you were saying about bedtime stories, I remember my father would tell my brothers and I campfire stories. We would, mm. we lived in the Chicago suburbs. We moved out to the suburbs from the city when I was really little. And we must have lived maybe 20 minutes outside. Um, but we, we also had this little trailer in Indiana that we would get away to and camp at. And I just remember my dad telling us stories. And in retrospect, they were really silly, but they terrified me. Hmm. Um, one was about the spud head. One was about uh, the Hoosier. It was this monster hmm. called the Hoosier because we were in Indiana. And it, like, I just remember him describing that someone would be like, encounter a Hoosier and then there would just be a scream and they'd never be heard from again. <laughs> and I remember him telling me at some point that a lot of the stories he told us were just ripped off of like sci-fi B movies from the fifties. Cause that's when he grew up <laughs> oh, and he amazing. remembered those and, and kind of repeated elements from them. But as a kid, I just remember being mesmerized. They weren't, they weren't as funny. My father's sense of humor and he does have a good sense of humor, but it's much more dry mm -hmm. and verbal. Um, and I, I, I have some of that and some of it, and especially earlier on, I think that was what most of my writing was. And then I also have an uncle on my mom's side who has a much more wild and zany sense of humor. Mm. And I think I am at the intersection between both of those things. And I, just seeing like my niece and nephew and the way I interact mm. with them and how their senses of humor are developing. I'm, like I'm curious how much of an effect I'm having on them. Yeah, it does feel like like even like mom and dad kind of have this kind of weird like they bring in both. You kind of have to be both of what they they are. Yeah. The older I get, the more I kind of see that you have both of those influences kind of interacting. Exactly, with, you know. especially in the ways that you didn't want to be influenced. Yeah, the things, the things that you don't want to admit are similar between yourself and your parents are usually the things that are most similar. Oh yeah, but I'm curious about the the stories that that you're working on or you're writing you mentioned the things that make a good bedtime story what encouraged you to do a deep dive into that i had just been it, it was just the track i was on i had found my soon-to-be wife uh she had two kids i started reading the bedtime stories and i started reading all these stories i had never read and always wanted to mm. we didn't do a lot of reading as kids so i started reading all the world doll stories uh, Peter Pan, oh, wow. uh, all the classics, you know, Grimm's fairy tales, just like, I just dove in and started reading all these and like, uh, Hobbit, you know, all these. And I was a blast and I was, I would think I was way more excited than the kids, but I loved reading <laughs> them out loud and seeing where like even a super old story, they would love it. Yeah. And that excited yeah. me and the universal themes that would like suddenly they would re really respond to. And it made me, especially, I especially really got excited about Roald Dahl because I felt like I could, if I felt a connection to the way he tells stories. Mm. And I really wanted to play with that. So, Wait, like, what about I, him, like, telling, like, what was it about it? Simplicity. I love, mm. I love simple stories, and he always keeps it really simple. Like, it's not, there's not a bunch of characters, a bunch of plot lines and crap going on. It's just like, interesting. But it's fun. And it's also, I think part of what it is is that, Roald Dahl doesn't write down to children. Like a lot of children's entertainment yeah, writes down to kids. Like kids, the environment is going on, <laughs> climate change. And like, it's all like you're, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, and we're trying to inject our ideas into their head. Yep. And uh, mm. I think that there's a certain, if you have a certain sense of wonder about childhood and about the amazingness of like, you know, children are, children are 
experiencing things for the first time and uh, there's a wonder there and having a sense of wonder for that wonder. And I don't know, there's just, mm. uh, when you write a children's story out of a, uh, an admiration for the medium and yeah, for right. the experience, I think it's a different thing than when you're thinking, I have to teach these kids about climate change. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. No, it's interesting. I, interesting. I think that's a big part of why Pixar was so successful earlier on. For sure. Because their stories didn't talk down to children. They just tried to make a story that they could relate to and found interesting and then trusted that children yeah. and families would as well. And Andrew Stanton even, even said after creating WALL-E when he was being congratulated by environmentalists that he had no intention of making mm. this an environmentalist film. And he actually sort of scoffed at a lot of the environmentalist <laughs> propaganda. He, he mentioned, <laughs> when I was a kid, we thought every time we we littered a Native American was gonna cry. My point was not to make kids feel bad about the environment. <laughs> I just thought that this was an interesting story. Yeah, and I feel like that's a, that's a thing I've noticed with kids too. Like, like when you talk to them as adults or in a way, like just not talking down to them, they definitely are receptive to that yeah. more than it is when you're kind of like making them feel smaller, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like, like John Hughes, I think he said, he's like, he didn't make like teen kid movies. He made young adult movies, and I think mm. that's why they're even still like appreciated to this day of this like talking with them as adults in a way. Mm -hmm. True. No, it's important. It's a huge part of expanding a kid's vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Like again, I'm a non-parent here, so what do I know? Yeah. But I just remember interacting with my niece, and she must have been about three. And I would just speak the way I normally would. And every once in a while, she would ask what a word meant. And it was kind of adorable, but you could also explain right. it to her. And even simple words that you sort of take for granted. You don't think of it. So I just mentioned to her that uh, her mom was going into labor with a younger brother. And I said something like, oh, I think I have a hunch. She'll come over with a little brother. She's like, what's hunch? Mm. What is hunch? And it's like, <laughs> well, hunch is like, that's when you think that something is going to happen. And then she starts trying to use it in a sentence. It's, oh, it's very, man. very cute. But yeah, it's a huge part of why you, you can't talk down to them. And I know oh, that yeah. when we were kids, our parents didn't. And my mom was a nurse. And so like she would use medical terminology around us and just like words that we had no business using right. as little kids. But it was still, it didn't hurt us to know For that. Sure. Yeah, that was one thing I found that's interesting too, even like about like the guy who was like the most Jeopardy winner is that you have so much more capability of memory than you think. Yep. So it's like learning more never hurts you. It never will like take up more space than needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, do you guys... Well, actually, I shouldn't say that learning more never hurts you. <laughs> no, I, I really shouldn't. I really shouldn't because right. there is a vice of being curious about things that are none of your business. Sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you guys feel like, is there any animators or creators right now that you admire that you would recommend to somebody like... Coming up, or is it more older school things mm. that you're kind of more into? Who's good? Who's good? Yeah, who's making stuff now that really impresses you? Yeah, I'm trying to think. I'm blanking out because I'm on the spot. <laughs> I know I have a ton of respect for, uh, is it Jindy Tartakovsky or Gindy? Mm. Hmm. The guy that made Samurai Jack. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. That was that, crazy uh, animation style. He just does a lot of really great stuff. I love it. You know, he's definitely one. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I don't know. I can't think off the top of my head. I know, I, know, I mean, there's a million amazing artists out right. there, that, but they're working on, you know, Disney stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. is there any animator, animation, like, shows or movies you would tell to, like, a young person wanting to get into animation that would kind of, like, spark their creativity? Mm. Yeah, That's what would really you even re yeah, what would you even recommend? Um, I mean, I got, like, I would recommend Peanuts. The stuff I know works yeah. for kids and is friendly to kids. I was very heavily influenced by The Simpsons, but in retrospect... They didn't exactly do good things for the culture. Hmm. I wasn't allowed to watch The Simpsons until I was a bit older even. Right. Hmm. And it seems really tame now because of everything oh, yeah. we have on television. But at the time, the stuff was edgy, like, probably for good reason. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of animated visuals, I would, I would recommend, really, I would recommend that kids watch stuff that is just extraordinarily well animated, like The Lion King yeah. or some of the Disney stuff from the Disney Renaissance era, just because you'll know what the gold standard is. Yeah, I, two, who framed Roger Rabbit's one that I just oh, That's man. incredible. I yeah. love watching that. And, and so Amazing. it's weird because with animation, there's these two tiers where it's like there's animation that's imitating the world and then there's animation that's imitating animation. Yeah. And I think with what we have to do with low budget productions, a lot of it is like animation imitating animation. Right. Like this is not Disney quality stuff. It's animated, it's moving, it's compelling and interesting, but we're trying to make these characters express themselves in a way that is readable. 
not necessarily in a way that matches up perfectly with how people move through the world. For sure. You guys, ha would you guys have any advice to someone getting into animation? Don't. Like, don't. <laughs> That's what I tell people that who want to write, where I'm like, if you can do anything else, do that. Because it will be a life of terribleness. Like, I remember I had one person, I sent a script to one girl, and she was like, I didn't even finish it. It was so bad. And I was like, that's like what you will deal with on a consistent <laughs> yeah. basis. I had, no, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I was being facetious. I think that if you have a talent for it and you enjoy it, look, I, I mean, I would go for it. I really would. Mm -hmm. Just start learning as early as you can, and it is never too late. So, right. you know, best time to start was 20 years ago. Second <laughs> best time is now. As but they the, say. Yeah, the weird thing about this but, question is to me, everybody I know who's like, is like us. Mm -hmm. They just were always like that. Like mm. they didn't go like, I should get into anime. Like I should get in. Maybe, maybe like, you know, different mediums. But like you were Mike always Judge, the type of guy, right? I think I, I was. But then there are examples like Mike Judge, who as far as I understand, right. was had an interest in animation. But that was not the career field he went into at all. And then I think he was a an engineer of some sorts. I don't quite yeah, remember. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but, he was but a brainiac not. type. Mm -hmm. And he ended up submitting some show reels that he'd put together to MTV. Yeah. And I, I believe there was something I think he might have been trained. I can't remember his story quite right, but he was not he was not somebody who you would traditionally expect to come from an animation background. And when you hear interviews with him, he's much more even keeled than most animators. Oh, yeah. But he's probably the most brilliant character writer oh, of sure. our generation. And his animation is is Fantastic. I love King of the Hill. Mm -hmm. I, I actually consider King of the Hill to be the best animated sitcom mm. of my lifetime, probably. Now, yeah. granted, most animated sitcoms have existed in my lifetime, except right. like the Flintstones and the Jetsons, but <clears throat> the writing for it is so subtle and so brilliant and so character-based. So... My fear is that if we tell people, you know, you weren't weird like this from day one, so don't oh, pursue yeah, it, yeah. then we lose out on the future right. Mike Judges and right. those types. Yeah, it's hard because, like, I feel like when I've met writers or creators, they have this sense, there's more of a job sense to it than, mm. like, a, like, a facet. Like, the people I've met who are, like, very, like, I don't know, like, the mystique is so big, it's like they yeah. usually never stay in it because it's, because when, when I would get into it, it's like film sets and things were so mundane and mm. slow where it's like, the people who really like it end up liking the mundane and slowness of it and the like meticulous natures of it. Mm. I guess my point is like people that like guys, I think of guys like me, you guys, Doug Tenipal, just creators mm -hmm. I know who just create. We can't not. That's yes, the thing. That, that's absolutely it's like right. Like when you say don't, like yeah. if, if that's an option for you, if you can just oh, like, man. I could not or I could. It's like, well, that's different because like, I just can't not. Like I have to. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. I don't know how to not be that. <laughs> That's it, how I am. And it even gets to the point where like once I am used to a project, then I feel like I have to be creating something else outside mm -hmm. of it. That's a huge struggle. Um, and part of what mitigates that is that with Freedom Tunes, the news cycle changes so quickly. So even though it's the same cartoon, we're often doing different things with different characters. Sure. But I've even got that itch where it's like I've been doing this for seven years now. And there are other projects that I'm interested mm -hmm. in, other things that I feel like I need to do on the side just to keep myself healthy in a creative sense. So it's, it's double-edged creativity, it really is. Jordan Peterson has a good quote on this. He says, like, I don't know, everyone wants to be creative. Well, it's not exactly obvious why yeah, you would want to be creative. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like it's not exactly <laughs> obvious why, that you should want to be creative. <laughs> Because he's right that creative people are not happy <laughs> yeah. when they're not being creative. Mm -hmm. And even if you get a creative job, which I have and I'm blessed to have, unless you are continually pushing yourself to innovate with it and you're not falling into a routine, you can end up just as unhappy as you would at any other job. You For really sure. can. Yeah. I feel like, like with creativity too, it's like I think a lot of people feel like it's something that it's like, yeah, you're either born with or not. But a lot of times I do feel like there's a lot more hard work that goes into mm -hmm. it. Like you may be naturally gifted with like a creative mind, but it's like what you're saying, when you come down to write the beats and stuff, there's so many yeah. like details. It feels more like a math problem in some yeah. ways. It's a lot of things, I think. And mm -hmm. this is also, I don't even know if I can define creativity. Yeah. It's, and I'm not saying there's no definition. And that's not me saying it's this wonderful, mysterious right, thing. Right. <laughs> I'm actually trying to figure out like, what do we mean when we're saying creativity? I don't know. 
Yeah, because it can be used in, maybe you're very creative in how you solve plumbing problems. Yes, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah, I do feel like there's a universal term. Like, I feel like every job has to have some kind of creativity, whether it's like just keeping yourself entertained and doing the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. But like, mm -hmm. I do feel like creativity and like the writing sense or like creating sense has to be more of like a, like they're, they're like the whole Tolkien kind of sub-creating thing too. Like using, because I do feel like, I've heard where it's like the best creativity is stolen almost from something else, like making something your own in a way. Like, like it's all stealing, right? Yeah, and like I like I like the G.K. Chesterton's thing. Maybe you for read. you guys, <laughs> my content's all original. I was doing political <laughs> animations on YouTube before the Pat before, Bundy. I'm just throwing that out before there. politics. Before were politics were yeah. big. Before po I was the first political cartoonist. Yeah. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I, like the what we were reading last weekend. What's wrong with the world? I liked G.K. Chesterton's thing about like like creating is almost like. Your the ownership of yourself, I think. Like I love that kind of idea that it's you're showing something that God created you, and like you're giving that out into the world. So yes, yeah. There's a lot to that that I lo loved. Well, and this is important because God created us to collaborate with Him in creation. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of it. I should yeah. say he he wants he wants to share that with us. It's why we have the ability to create. And really, humans don't create so much as we rearrange. Right. What God mm -hmm. already Sub, made. Subcreating. Kind of a, yes. Yeah. Yes. It's not an ex nihilo act of creation when you do anything. Even if it seems that way. Even if it seems that way with an idea. Well, like the language you're using to what articulate when you that idea. Gender. Yeah. Or your own gender. <laughs> it's ex like nihilo. Yeah. Ex -nilo. Very creative in that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. That's exactly what I meant. But, yeah, creativity. I, I really don't know exactly how to define it. Is it just a way, is it just a mechanism for problem solving? Mm -hmm. And then when that mechanism for problem solving is applied to artistic endeavors, we call it creativity, but we don't in other places. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I think that it, yeah, there's a weird thing. Like You have whatever your fascination is, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then you have your life. Mm -hmm. Like, I had a fascination for art, drawing, but I also had, I grew up in a family where we moved almost every year. So I had a really hard time making friends. Yeah. So my friend was my sketch pad. And it was my way of making new friends. Mm -hmm. They'd see the drawing and they'd want to talk to me. Yeah, interesting. Uh, and then I also had a mom who, you know, my parents divorced when I was like eight. And she was this hard worker and she worked us hard. So I was like trained to work very hard. And I think that in, informed my work ethic. Because, I, you know, I look back on high school and like there was tons of creative people that were good at art. You know, like at, at that level, at high school level. And then, like, you know, you move on and some of them got pregnant and some of them yeah. did drugs. And, you know, it's just all... Let's not put getting pregnant on the same level as doing drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, getting, you know... Getting... Actually, my mother's been pregnant, so I say I resent that. <laughs> getting getting pre pregnant at age 14 kind of thing. Yeah, okay, you know, like, that's, that's what I mean. Well, enough, well there's two where it's like I've seen it too yeah, where, like, it's... some writers are way better than me, but it's like I feel like I'm the only one writing, though, still. There's a lot of that, yeah. too. Where, like, that is absolutely right. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, in some ways, the best person is the best person who's doing it, yeah. right? I mean, we live in a marketplace now, especially with the YouTube algorithm requiring you to constantly churn things out where quantity has become quality. And in some ways, I lament that because it would be great to just create something that I could spend a lot of time on and was really polished and upload that and be able to retain right. the same viewer base. But then on the other hand, being forced to constantly churn things out has helped keep my work fresh and creative. And so when you look at people who are extremely talented, but they almost never make anything, yeah. you really wonder if you can say that person is more talented than someone sure. who's continually churning out content because someone is actually making something. I mean, what is a gift that you don't use? Yeah, that's the thing I've thought about a lot too because I've I've seen people who are just so good and then it's just they don't want to make anything though. Yep. They're kind of like like you say it's like it's not almost like the drug or pregnant, but what it's like they just their life's they have other priorities in a way right. too. It's like I think part of creativity is prioritizing creative things, I think mm. too. And a lot of people are hung up on what's going to succeed. Like they think they have this one project, they think this is going to be their Lord of the Rings. Ah. Right. And there's one thing I learned about Axe Cop is that you can't choose your successes. So I mm. I had that was just one of a bunch of stuff I was making. It was the last thing I thought was going to be successful. That's so funny. And it was, you know, you just don't get to pick what's going to, so just make stuff. Yeah, well, and it's a weird thing, too, where we see that on a smaller scale, too, just within the same project. There are some Freedom Tunes videos that I've made, and I was sure they were going to be a hit. Yeah. And then there, and they weren't. And then there's other videos I made that I didn't think were all that great, but the audience liked it. 
Right. Yeah. You can never. Yeah. I like or how at least you said the algorithm that. did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> fair enough. The fair algorithm enough. gods. Yeah. yeah. You, got me there. you got me on that one. Well, one thing I've been thinking about a lot too, because it's like I mean I've done. This will be the last question. Yeah. I got a babysitter. I got to release. Really <laughs> um, one thing I've always wondered too is like, do you guys feel with the way culture is heading, is it going to be as crazy where you can't like be associated with the Babylon Bee or Freedom Tunes? In the making of things, is are, it not that way already? Like, like that's what yeah, I'm wondering. Talking about. We're already, is it, is yeah, we're already, shifting we're already both finished in the animation. I know exactly. Yeah, fortunately, like, I never planned on working at one of those studios. My goodness. Yeah. Oh man, I really want to be treated poorly and have somebody else <laughs> own all of my IP for the rest of my life. Please, Disney, <laughs> oh, let me man. work yeah. for you. But, yeah, I think I did get a taste of that when I worked at DreamWorks on Veggie Tales and just realized, like, I don't know, this is not a great environment for. Right. Yeah. Well, know. and this is the thing. It is if you want to go into animation. You might think that the best thing in the world is to have the name brand recognition of Disney or Pixar on your resume. And maybe it's good to do something like that for a year, though I would dissuade you from, from right. working for those companies because I think they're genuinely evil. But I would, I would argue that if you are a creative person, it is ideal to work at a smaller studio. Right. So with my they're workers... They're turning brilliant artists into cogs. Exactly, mm. exactly. And so the people who are doing work for Freedom Tunes, we have a very small team. But because we have a small team, they all have their hands in everything. Right. And they're all doing the thing that they want to do and that they're good at. It, it's not like we're giving you this one small piece on the assembly line. Yeah. And there is a little bit of that where like you're better at this, so you're going to work on this. And the person who's better at that is going to work on that. But there's a lot of overlap between these things. Whereas when you're at a large studio, it's like you're just rigging. You're just modeling. Right. You're just doing uh, armatures. And... I think that can really kill somebody's creativity. You don't, yeah. generally speaking, people don't go into these industries because they want to do one small thing on an assembly line. Yeah, yeah. But that's Maybe. what it is at a big studio. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's soul sucking. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, most are working on some remake of like some, you know. <laughs> exactly. It's not even like an exciting Brave property. Brave little toaster remake or something. Yeah. Whatever it is. That, that actually I would wouldn't be as that. bad. Yeah. yeah <laughs> My Little Pony remake number nine. <laughs> whatever it is. Brave Little Toaster was dark. Was it? Do you remember at the beginning where the... Bizarre, the, I rewatched it recently. I think I do the, remember the, a dark um, part of it. Air conditioner voiced by Phil Hartman. He yeah. just like shorts out and dies. And it's, it's <laughs> oh, really no. weird. Like, dies, yeah. He starts getting angry. And I was like, what? Yeah. Oh, man. It's a strange yeah. movie. It is yeah, really I, strange. Well, we're having you on the interview show, so we'll <laughs> talk more then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, this was fun. Yeah, this was great. Was a nice <laughs> little bonus uh, video. It's probably gonna be like four hours long. How long did we do this? Yeah, for? yeah like I have no idea. Hours. I didn't mind. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, was it. Great. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> cool, cool. All right, well, thanks for watching. This camera. The, the big box probably the big there. one. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for coming. Bye, folks. Goodbye. <laughs>